What's happening, family? It's your man, CRB Jr. here at Motown Mafia Podcast. Of course, a Big Boss Filmworks production. All is well. We got some hot stuff that we want to give you a little update on some different platforms to check out some of the unique content that we do over here at Big Boss Filmworks. So, most of you who have followed our story know that at some point after we got out the streets, we got involved in the apparel business. And as we got deeper and deeper involved in the apparel business, we hooked up with a Lebanese apparel cartel that were involved in um, selling Nike gym shoes and different forms of apparel and purses that, shall we say, we had our own supply source that we did not have to go through traditional distribution methods for us to get the inventory. And of course, we ran up a pretty nice sized bag with that Lebanese clothing cartel. So we dealt some stuff in the past, talking about the orange box, which is talking about the hustle that we had going on uh, with the Nikes, Air Force Ones, and Jordans. So if you really want to get some details about that, it'll give you some insights about the apparel business, how it really functions, the back door and the front door of the apparel business, check out the orange box post. It is available on our Patreon, that is patreon.com at Big Boss Filmworks. Again, that's patreon.com at Big Boss Filmworks. So check out the orange box, it'll get you some ideas if you're in the apparel business or just in business in general because no matter what business you're in, whether it be apparel, food, content, fashion, there's always a front door and a back door and understanding how both of those work. So it's worth your time. Subscribe to us. We even got a free membership over there at Patreon. And then, of course, we got some different tiers going on. But give it a shot. Go over to Patreon.com at Big Boss Filmworks. Check out the orange box. It's hot. It's your man, CRB Jr., Big Boss Filmworks, doing what we do. Holla. Um, is it fair to say that we had more shoes than Foot Locker? Most Foot Lockers. <laughs> I'll never forget it. I mean, I, I saw clear Air Jordans. I saw every conceivable colors of Air Force Ones. I mean, sh shit that wasn't even made. Hey, right. right, exactly. When I had more shoes than Foot Locker, why didn't you say, Courtney, you've gone crazy? I told you you've gone crazy. <laughs> I just, you just didn't hear me when I said it. Because <laughs> you was crazy. <laughs> Where was that store at? Right next to him. <laughs> right he was next, next to Foot Locker. Foot Locker <laughs> and he had more shoes than Foot Locker. In fact, the people in Foot Locker were sending the customers over to his store. Yeah, yeah, that's how crazy yeah. it had gotten. Yeah. We're saying, man, really one more year like this, at the pace we going, it's 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 checkmate. You know, we we literally about to pull. Our projections was in 2007 that we was gonna take, or 2000, yeah, 2007 we would take a million dollars out the hood. Just it wasn't just smoke. You could see the fire. I mean, it was to the point where there were uh, news reports of, of the busts beginning to happen. Rome was falling. Rome was falling. Eight local men have been indicted by a federal grand jury today, charged with crimes that could send them to prison for 20 years if convicted. Four are from the same family. It is alleged the men have been trafficking counterfeit shoes and clothing worth tens of thousands of dollars and selling them as genuine goods in many stores in Dearborn and Detroit. Three of the stores were closed up to the merchandise in the windows today may be real, but federal investigators say counterfeit goods were being sold there before being confiscated. The first, the first bag y'all got, we definitely big man. It was better than the bag that the Italians had that y'all ran through, or similar symbol. Let me think on that. Let me, let me really think on that. The first bag of '83 when I met the big man. Is we on camera? Yeah. All right. Listen. The first bag when I got it from the big man. Tracy Sledge called me and said somebody wanted to meet you. I was on Foster Schoolcraft at my man Nardi house. Mm -hmm. 
God bless his soul. You know what I'm saying? And I got the call of the uh, 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 Dairy Queen around the corner of Foss and Schoolcraft. I told them to meet me up there. So, they told me what time, I met them up there. I pull up in my car, I jump in Eddie's car, Tracy in the front seat, I jump in the back. He said, my name is Eddie Jackson. I say, pleased to meet you. I've heard a lot about you, sir, because I respect him, because my grandmother, I heard my grandmother talk about this man. My grandmother was a, in the car uh uh, club where they they play poker and all that and they gamble right right and they throw parties you know what I'm saying so of course the drug dealers and the pimps come to those games and, right. and play cards but that was the after hour with joints basically for card games so anyways he said I, I, I heard that you can uh, this is Eddie talking he said I heard you uh, can move product I said I, you know, I, I can do a little something you know what I'm saying he said listen I want to give you 50 quarters. A thousand a quarter. That's 50,000. I just meet this man. Mm -hmm. And he say, uh, I'm going to give you 50 quarters. What can you do with him? At this time, you know what I'm saying, I'm just school teacher who I was with when my man got demise came. He was out. And just to help people when you say, man, you're talking about the WWW. WWW, my man. Right. My, my, all right, my yeah. success, you know, my, uh, That's some, yeah, one of your mentors. Yeah, my mentors, you know what I'm saying? So, I say, yeah, I can handle it, man, I can move it. I say, but Mr. Jackson, just like that, I say, Mr. Jackson, I'm going to tell you right, right now, before you here in the streets, I'm leaving town. I'm going to Boston. But when uh, Big Pep was uh, reminiscing about his days in Boston, it really made me kind of do some reflecting. Like, I remember this has to be like 81, 82. Uh, we were in Tracy Jabba the Hutt's uh, basement, which was kind of like the hangout for Pep's YBI crew and just guys from the neighborhood in general. But um, a bunch of these guys from Boston had come into town. Uh, one guy I remember, I think, is not with us anymore, a brother by the name of Fly Guy Ty. He was the first guy, uh, he had heavy kind of accent. Uh, I think Fly Guy was the well, first guy I ever heard call himself Fly. You know this whole Boston situation. Uh, they're good friends of mine, man, in Boston. Every, we was a family. Every guy, every we, guy that's from Boston, I know he's good friends. Yeah. So we were we became a family. And a few of the guys moved down there. We talked about Yancey, Yang, Yang, every Yang. That's where I lived at my mama's house on Leslie. So tell me, your, because this is, again, R.P. to this brother. This is the brother that was killed in the... No, family. not Yin Yang. Yin Yang's still Yang's living. living. Yeah, okay. Yeah, he's Yancey a... Yes, yeah. he was... Hold on. Yes, he was the first one to come and stay. I had a few come before that, but they, but couldn't, they, didn't they, stay. Couldn't, they couldn't handle the doghouse. I had a thing on Nard at the doghouse, and they left in the middle of the night and got on a bus and went back to Boston. They couldn't handle it. They couldn't handle it. Right. One thing I will say about Yancey, and his his situation was unique too. He couldn't go back. He at couldn't the time. go back. He so like, he I went to Boston. He had to come to Detroit. So he made it work for he him. He made it work for him. And he ended up coming up here and taking over the whole city. He took over Pontiac. Yeah. And on his own. I did. Yeah. But he was my son. Exactly. He was yeah. my son as well. Yeah. So, so you man. got immersed in that Boston clique. Too. Yes. Absolutely. So it's interesting that at that early date. Uh, some very young guys, or it must have been in their early 20s and some were teenagers, could leave Detroit and go to a whole other city. And Boston was a lot different then. Boston was a pretty high crime, rough city back then. Of course, it's been gentrified a lot. And uh, not exactly sure to which projects was tied in. I think it was Columbia Point. Now, how did you even know about working in Boston? Well, that comes from... Uh you know, uh, being with W.W., you know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, some a situation that came, you know what I'm saying, arose where I had to leave Detroit. You know what I'm saying? And uh, he didn't have nowhere to send me. You know what I'm saying? Send me. So, you know what I'm saying? He had sent a team out there before. And saying, 
My man Blood was was the one that discovered Boston. But anyways, really, that's another story. Okay. I'm saying, but he sent a team out there that failed the mission. It so didn't work out. It right. didn't work out. You know, I don't want to give no names. But it just didn't. It didn't work the out. Deal didn't go right. I'm saying. So, you know, push ahead. They come home, failed mission. He ain't thinking about going back there no more. But at this time, I'm one of his top people in his organization, and a situation going to occur, occur where I had to leave. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, W, what are we going to do here? And he thought about, well, listen, I got a place, man. It's, it's way away from home. But I can get you away from here, you know what I'm saying? And he sent me out there and gave me a sack. And as I recall in your book, Great book, by the way, people. Uh, Bound by Honor, Torn by Greed. The True and Untold Story of the Young Boys Incorporated, told by Pepsi and Picks. And Picks. All right, so yeah, you make sure that's a great book. Great. Got to read all the books about this life and that, that book right up there. So you take the first bag, come back. Obviously, it'll work out for you. The 50 Quarters work out in Boston. Yeah, the 50 Quarters work out in Boston. You know what I'm saying? So, you know. After that, you know what I'm saying, uh, you know, I had, I had, I, you know, you know, I was, I was, I was fortunate than most people, you understand, that was in the game. I, I had two cities. Back in, in 81, 82, that was unheard of. I guarantee you, ain't a, ain't a, ain't a guy in the drug game can say in 81, 82 that they was going, taking over no city, nowhere. They were all the Boston guys were conversing and they were dropping names that, of course, would end up becoming famous, like Bobby Brown, Michael Bivens, people end up being new addition. And, of course, that ended up spilling over Bobby, ended up getting with Whitney. Seal, the one who was killed. Yeah. We were re we became like, real close. I was talking to him. every. He was about to marry Bobby's sister. Bobby Brown. Uh, Bobby yeah. Brown. And he was living with her in Atlanta. We used to talk yeah, yeah. every day, man. I remember my wife was excited about going because she thought she's about to meet Whitney Houston. We about to go to this wedding. I didn't hear from Seal for about three or four days. I knew something was wrong then. His sister reached out. You know, this is pre-internet. Right, right. His sister reached out to me and told me what happened. He ended up getting killed. Okay. Do what? We're going to get to that when we all, all right. get to know. We all link right. up. So now at this time, because you, you know, in your run, in the, in the building of the legend of Pep, some of the hottest cars. Was you around when, um, and I know Skippy, you would definitely be a sneak, when um, WW, I think, like, and Drew, like, he was one of the first people that brought right. Prince to the city? Yes. Yes. Okay. And when he was just with Soft and had the Soft and Wet out. What you, what are you asking? No, do you, you remember that? Oh, yeah. I left going to Boston for a Prince concert. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, this is kind of history. The night, the night I left going to Boston, me and WW was backstage at a press concert at Masonic Temple that he had brought to the, to the city. And that's the night I had to leave. We left out on a red eye going to Boston. Leaving the press concert. Leaving the press concert. Parked the, left the 6.9 6 in the parking lot at the airport. See, the ten of the still had parked the trip to Boston. Well, no, the trip to Boston, well... I had never been to Boston, of course, but I got to leave the city for whatever uh, for whatever reasons. You know what I'm saying? So he'll take me to Boston. We get on the plane, we go to Boston. Back then, it was a uh, 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 airline called Republic Airline. Now I think it was renamed to Northwest. Yeah. So we took Republican Airline to Boston. We got there around eleven thirty, twelve. I, I, you know what I'm saying? I've never rode on a subway or anything like that. Well, I didn't, we don't even do buses no more in Detroit. We either in a cab or we got a car. You know what I'm saying? Because we, we get money. You know what I'm saying? We don't ride buses. We ain't kids. You know what I'm saying? So we are kids, but we ain't kids. You know what I'm saying? We feel we grown. We get money. So we get off the airplane. We come out. We get on a bus. We got the blue line. You know what I'm saying? Then we get off the bus and we at a train station. It's the orange line and it takes us into Boston. I never rode subway in my life. I ain't been no farther. The first I ever been in my life was down south and I was a kid. To, but my mother named the family, my family reunion. Mm -hmm. Then 
then before the end, after that, it was Pontiac. And that's why I was up in Pontiac rolling. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, not knowing that Pontiac... See, let me ask, let me just say this. I gotta say I've been fortunate as far as streets. It's not maybe not a good thing, but I have been fortunate. All my experiences in my young childhood coming up being in the streets prepared me for Boston and I didn't know it. And the whole idea of young people being in charge of the drugs and making the money instead of old people and users, they, I mean, that was a powerful idea from city to city. So it went from Detroit to Boston and even to this day, Benzino and Pep. So, you know, they've had some book signings and events together. And Cavario had me over at Benzino's house and I know Pep's son, shout out to Luxury Mar, and we were talking about Boston and Detroit and I asked Benzino, Oh, you remember a guy named Pep? And he looked at me like, how the hell do you know who that is? And I was like, oh, you can call him up right now. So, and they got reconnected. And um, to this day, there's still ties. And obviously, it's about 40 years. It's not ties over drugs. It's just they became friends. And I guess people still interact with each other, Pep and uh, Benzino. Detroit. I was fucking with YBI in 87. I couldn't say nothing until Pep wrote the book. And then I could say, yeah, nigga, you crazy. I was in Detroit in the 80s. My nigga sale dog shot, Alderman Kid, Pep, YBI. We've been fucking with each other. Is that when the air, when you come across Ray Benzino, shout out to Benzino. Benzino come from four corners through my man Corcho, through my man Fly. See, like I say, I didn't let, I didn't let, you had to be, you had to go through a select choice to come to Boston. I didn't let niggas from Detroit come to Boston because I didn't want to have to I didn't want to do nothing to them or try to cross me because like, this shit is sweet so I had choice people that I brought that they know better whatever the case may be as recently as just a few years ago there was a huge indictment of Columbia Point and the Boston News was referring to them as to biggest gang in Boston and uh, I mean they weren't created by the people in Detroit but uh, definitely strong ties around the era went in the fact also that the guys from Detroit could come and Boston's right down the road from New York and they were able to outcompete the New York dealers and become at least for a time the, the uh, biggest game in town with the H business Dozens of members belonging to Boston's largest and most powerful gang have been arrested. Federal authorities said today members and associates of the Columbia Point Dogs were indicted on drug and gun charges. They say the gang started operating out of the Columbia Point housing project in the Dorchester section of Boston in the 1980s, eventually trafficking drugs from Boston up to Maine. Which incidents are we talking about? This operation didn't just dismantle a large-scale drug trafficking network. It focused on individuals who gang prosecutors believe are responsible for much violence in our city. Authorities are still looking for seven other people, but Conley continued to say the city is a safer place with these, these members in jail. That was one of the neighborhoods that, um, it was two projects. So then Bobby was from one project and um, then Zeno and them was from another project. Michael Bivens and the rest of New Edition were from another project. But Bep, when he put his thing down out there, um, they ended up actually at Detroit Crew. And then I guess they rebranded themselves YBI to the... Um, oh, but they were they Columbia Point dogs. Right. That was his. Wayne just supplying the dope. Wayne didn't. See, well, Wayne never, see listen, Wayne never guy. expected yeah. that... And I'm going to be honest with you. He sent me there really to fail. Because... Because the team he said before failed. Well, he sent him notes just to get him. Just to get me, just say, I ain't gonna say the fail, to get me out, to get out the way. Right. He didn't expect me to Make do what I'd done. Yeah, yeah. It was saying, but I'm, I I can't come back home. But And I can't join here with y'all where y'all get the money in the joint. You sent me here. I got to make this work for me. I still got, I got a, I got a wife, Jamie wasn't born. I got a wife and a kid. I got a woman and a kid at home. Right. I'm going to show you the mindset. Wayne never let it go, though, although he sent two crews up there, didn't he? And they had to come back. 
he still never, he like, man, it's a gold mine. But, then, he, it was in the back of his mind, gone. but what made him push to go there is because he had no place to send me and I was a, a loyal servant to him in Detroit. So he had to get me out of there. Mm -hmm. So he said, fuck it. Here, take a quarter, seven grams. You That's started it. that Boston thing with a quarter. With seven grams. <laughs> he didn't expect that. When he when, when I called him and said, listen, I'm through. Shocked the shit out of him. He said, how much you got? I said, I got 10,000. Wait a minute. Seven grams. Wait a minute. You made off seven grams. I made 10,000. Listen. Was. Listen, he, he got there quick as hell. I know he did. Yeah. And in and, and that point, it was on from that point. But, um. They were all the Boston guys were conversing and they were dropping names that of course would end up becoming famous. Like Bobby Brown, Michael Bivens, people end up being new addition, and of course that ended up spilling over Bobby, ended up getting with Whitney. Now, a guy who would become famous, you would cross paths with in Boston, entertainer by the name of Bobby Brown. Yeah, well Bobby, you know what I'm saying? I met Bobby. When I met Bobby, I met him through Yancey. Yin Yang, we call him, I named him, we named him Yin Yang in Boston. He was like 13 years old when I Shout recruited him. Shout out to Yin Yang. Shout out to Yin Yang. <laughs> you know that man too? Oh, yeah. my man. So, yeah. oh, we gotta remember yeah. him. Get on. So, uh, yeah. you know, that was his man. They used to, see, when we got to Boston, they, the guy, I got to Columbia before, I was fortunate enough. And they was just as blessed for me to even drop in their projects. Columbia Point. And it, re it was renamed the CPD, Columbia Point Dogs. You know what I'm saying? You know, Detroit, that's a Detroit thing. Everything a dog in Detroit. So we put the D on it. Y'all the Columbia Point Dogs now. You know what I'm saying? So, you know what I'm saying? Bobby come out there. This is for the talent show. He was a shoplifter. He was a shoplifter. I mean, yes, he was shoplifting Jordan Marsh in Boston. A big Jordan Marsh was like Hudson's to us in Boston. They used to shoplift. He smoke or smoke some weed with Bobby, whatever. And he was always in a talent, in a group, which was new addition. And they, one day they won this talent show. And it was all from there. And then Bobby went all from there, you know, new addition blew up. Blew up. You know what I'm saying? That's why my wife got pictures with Bobby. And then Skip, you got the young Skip. With pictures with Bobby, Bobby and the old Skip with pictures with Bobby. We took, when Bobby came in town, what, five years ago? He left us tickets at the gate. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He we always, went, when he comes to Whenever he comes, he comes yeah. to holler at us. You know what I'm saying? He was actually talking about making the movie. You know what I'm saying? But, you yeah, know. Yeah. He was on the plane one day reading a book. But, no. Uh, no. Uh, Michael, Michael, Michael Bibbins was reading the book. And Michael Bibbins was reading your book? He's reading my book. Okay. And, and, he, and he tell he said, Bobby, you in this book. He said, you know these guys, man? You in this book. And that's when they... Yeah, he called Bobby, Bobby, called her. See, because Seal was about... Seal Dog Shaw was about to marry Bobby's sister before he got killed. But that was Yancey Woman first. Yeah, Yancey Carol, Woman's first. And yeah. that's how they got back in touch with us. Carol called me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they'll go with you. Um, this brother Seal, I believe we should be saying R.I.P. Yeah. yeah. Because um, he ended up passing away, but Bobby was around he was in Bobby's car or something like that the way that yeah, he got, it was all his, his demise uh, came in the Rolls Royce that was on the set of uh, the bodyguard with Whitney Houston and Kevin Costner Whitney Houston, I mean Kevin Costner gave Whitney Houston that Rolls Royce for his gratitude for being in that, sh that movie with him and Bobby was driving that night you know what I'm saying, at the club when uh I, I'm not going to speak names, but the guy that used to be with me back in Boston, when I was in Boston, was the one that killed Seal. In the car? In the car, next to Bobby. Next to Bobby. Yeah. In the Bentley that? In the Bentley. That Kevin Cosner. Gabe. Gabe. Gabe, Gabe, yeah. Gabe Whitney. Gabe Whitney. So yeah. the Hollywood in the streets then straight converge. Yes, right now. yes. He... And the guy Yancey that I talk about. Right. That was his man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yang Yang. That was his man. So that's why he Yang was with us that day too when we took him to the yeah. concert. He had the yeah. Bitches. Yep. So I remember Bobby telling Yang that day. Because he had seen Yang in ye in, in about a year or so. Yang, been up here. Yang was up here. He couldn't go back to Boston. Although he went back and took care of all that night. Yeah, so I, had he's my, I, I, I got him a house in Oak Park. 
Yeah. Like my crew from Boston, I, I bought them a house in Oak Park, of Nine Mile. And that's where all of them stayed at, except for Seal. Seal stayed at my mama's house because I was beefing with Butch. And he was bodyguarding my house, my mama's house, make sure they were safe. See, when they get it misconstrued about Seal came and he was Wayne's bodyguard, no. He was my family's bodyguard. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. So, so did you, y'all work that, y'all work that out for Bobby? We just made him feel safe, man. My conception is the one worked it out for him. Yeah. Okay. We just yeah. made him safe in Detroit. Yeah. He was scared to go to the car. Matter of fact, he came to cars before that and canceled it because of that. What? Yeah, see, everybody got it misconstrued with Seal Dog Shot. Seal Dog Shot never have, after, I don't like saying never, he, he hasn't ever met WW. WW had died before Seal became part of my organization in Boston. Okay. They, they got on there saying that Seal came to Detroit as WW's bodyguard. No, he came to Detroit as my bodyguard. Yeah, that's on that Wikipedia page. He lived, he lived, he lived, he lived on the Wikipedia listen, page? Yeah. yeah, listen. I stationed him at my mama's house to protect my family. I brought him from Boston because he was raised. I had a house called the castle. I'm going to tell you this how this went. Skip. So listen, this is how this went. When I got to Boston, of course, Seal, his family disabandoned him. He was in a boy's home. He only come home on the weekends. And he, on the weekend, he'd come home and he'd, and it, at Sunday, he'd, get, he'd be at the bus stop catching the bus home back to the boys' home. So, you met, see, Columbia Point was, Columbia Point is, probably was and still is the richest land in Boston. Because it Columbia had, Point Project. Columbia Point right. Project, CPD, Columbia Point Dogs. It's, it's, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, JFK Library sits on that island. UMass College sit on that island. And that project is only one way. It used to be only one way in and one way out. Into the back was nothing but the ocean. You only turn around and get back out one way. And that was my cubby hole. That's why I was so protected in that in that project. You know what I'm saying? You know, so, you know what I'm saying? Saying all that, you know what I'm saying? That, you know, I lost my... my Okay, so now we're going back to, yeah, so your man Yancey, the mice. No, no, no seal. 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 So, yeah, what I was saying is seal. they got on Wikipedia and all that, the seal came. Seal, a lot of these guys, Wayne had never met. I got in Boston in the beginning of 82, February of 82. Wayne died. In September. So for a minute you had brought a few of those guys from Boston, I know. Only back. two. I only bought two home before Wayne died. That because was Kid. And Fly Guy? No, Fly Guy would come from, from see, see, uh, listen. I, Rest in peace, Fly Guy. Listen, listen, listen. listen. I, met Fly I was very protective over Boston. Yeah. It's only six people ever from Detroit ever been there. Ain't nobody ever been in Boston since I've been there from Detroit to Road. Man, let me, let me drive this insight. The reason why Boston was such a big factor, not only in Wayne life, but in his, Boston sold a pack of dope, sold for $12 in Detroit. Mm -hmm. The same exact pack of dope sold for $40 in Boston. A bundle, only, a bundle, but a, then they would also, they would sell half a packs for $20. Oh, they, and they would call rips. rips. Listen, Boston, wow. that's why I, they couldn't understand when Bush them couldn't understand how Wayne was making all his money. They couldn't understand how Wayne had bought all those cars in 1982. You understand what I'm saying? I'm going to wait till you're done. Okay, go ahead. For now, for you know, he, he, they couldn't understand how Wayne was buying all these cars in 1982. He spent close to a half a million in cars. But he got a five dollar special in Detroit. He sell blows for five dollars. That was unheard of all summer long. Yeah, you always wait. But I'm in Boston getting four times the amount. A bundle in Detroit, he get fifty dollars for it at most one twenty. I'm getting four hundred. And selling the same amount. Selling the same amount. So the same so amount. Not like you getting forty dollars a pack, but I'm only and now, $1, now $1, listen. $1 well, at that time Wayne was living. The most I'd done maybe nineteen thousand a day. 
in Boston. When he got when he died, that's when I took it up to forty or fifty thousand a day. I was getting forty or fifty thousand a day. And then at one point I had Detroit and Boston going together. I was getting close to eighty, ninety thousand a day. And I think that Adidas thing that YBI had definitely became a Boston signature associated with one of the one of the gangs. And when they cracked down on the gangs in Boston in the late eighties, they talked a lot about that. So guys like you, Peppy. It ain't we ain't just talking crazy. All of this what y'all see in hip hop and this lifestyle, this is what you guys was That's doing. We started hip hop. Y'all started that. We the culture. Rap. Don't we get call it the culture. 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 Yeah. No, we I the culture. Culture. We yeah. just started rap. And well, whatever you may call the culture, I you don't even have to call it hip hop culture, but that culture we live in the early in the late seventies, mid seventies, early eighties. Dude, just check the facts. Check our pictures out. Listen, yeah. we was wearing top tens. Listen, when people listen, sixty dollars for a pair of gym shoes was outrageous in seventy eight, seventy nine. You know what I'm saying? And the reason and listen, I we my son put a thing on, I told him put this on the internet. Ask him what 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 did the what did Detroit YBI Detroit call top tens back in the day? You remember the kid? What's that kid? These little kids they call him all the You know all? He works for you. You know what we call him? What's that? Six. YBI? No, we call them sixties because we just used to win Converse for thirteen, fourteen dollars. Here it is. Adidas that came out with some gym shoes. We got the shell toes. Adidas, a Brian DLC, they wouldn't even wear. They wouldn't even out in seventy eight, seventy nine. They wouldn't even thought about it. You know what I'm saying? We wear shell toes. Then they came out with these fucking gym shoes, top tiers. They wanted. Fifty nine ninety something came up to sixty dollars with taxes of change, and we hustling. And them looking, we them three sides we looking sweet, high top. Like my nigga thought that nigga getting a break on the spot. He making shoot out the north man. Man, pick up me a pair of them sixties. You had a kid they called them all flavors. Didn't he have every man? Yeah, listen, Jim shoot every time. Oh, no, that was Mister Fila. That's Mister Fila. Mister Fila, Reno. Ricky Reno. Yeah, Ricky that was Reno. my man. Okay. Okay. They don't know, man. We was two setters. They don't know. We started to feel it. Cause I'm gonna tell you, <laughs> Fila Sue used to be $500, $600. Y'all, y'all used to come through Northland, man, and buy that joint out. Oh, yeah. Listen, right. Skip, tell so, me, Fila Sue's was $600. Yeah, by then, we had started hitting Somerset. Somerset. We was in Somerset. Oh, wait a minute. Tots ta- ta- Tennis on, on, in, in Bloomfield. And they talk about this Cartier phenomenon now. Oh, yeah. And y'all was wearing Cazals. And six hundred dollars sunglasses. Carrera, Carrera Porsche. Oh, just what? Listen, yeah, listen, man. Listen, 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 if you look at pictures of me and Skip back in nineteen eighty four, they talk about man. I was, I was wearing, I was rocking man purses, Louis Vuitton back in nineteen eighty four and eighty five, Louis Vuitton. I, I, that's a fact. But um, yeah, that that whole Boston Detroit nexus that overlaps with. Benzino, Bobby Brown, New Edition, uh, then Vinkery, obviously, Whitney Houston, and um, I guess he even talks about the Vinks are one of those guys from that um, Boston situation ended up getting killed in a, in a big way that was given to uh, Whitney from Kevin Costner. So just another example by how this Detroit um, cartel, or this, this Detroit nexus, Detroit crews activities reached so far beyond Detroit and so deep into all of what became um, African American culture. So, shout out to Big Pap, shout out to Skip, shout out to all those guys from back in the day. How at you, man? Sure, we do. So, YBI from Detroit to Boston. There you go. Nineteen seventy-three, the Detroit Free Press's front page proclaims dope kingpins get away with it. They had names like Jesse James, Pretty Ricky, the Black Greek, and Mr. Clean. Two of the twelve men listed as Detroit's biggest heroin dealers were next-door neighbors, and in reality, they were the two largest heroin dealers in Detroit, dwarfing the other men on the list. Got twelve kilos. We gonna cut it ten times at a minimum, so it would have been one hundred and twenty kilos. The audience needs to understand the significance of black entrepreneurship. Customer give me the money, put the money through a chute in the door, 
they would drop the dope down right in front of the door. And everybody was getting money. Everybody was getting money that time. Always bags of money coming and going in the house. Almost to the ceiling, just a room full of money stacked to the ceiling. Eddie had shot past everybody in the city put together. The gentleman gangster. You meet the right people, make the right connections, to make everyone happy, and do it all without having to really brandish a gun. Nicky Bond, snitch. Frank Lucas, snitch. Where's the real ones? I said, give me the pistol. And I said, I should blow your goddamn brains out right now. The 750 murders last year was a record for Detroit, murder capital of the country. This is a story about a real one. From the beginning to the end, never telling on nobody. Eddie the Fat Man Jackson, charismatic son of a pool hall owner, and his chief lieutenant, Courtney the Field Marshal Brown, a former city bus driver, had built an empire on a par with men like Nicky Barnes and Frank Lucas of New York. But theirs was a very different and in many ways more sophisticated operation than Barnes and Lucas's, based on family ties and finesse more than murder and mayhem. I went into that foolishness. It was business to me. He kept it so separate and he's my Little League baseball coach. Family came first. He would keep a pistol at the bottom of the Halloween bag. Boom, 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 boom. I'm gonna shoot you right down. We had guys working three shifts. They were just like they worked before. We, we paid vacation. They worked eight hours a day. They got paid for overtime. And we had a bunch of law workers. Okay, I'm gonna take 250 people. I got a million to blow. We all gonna go down here and blow this million together. Throwing money out of the car, down in the Brewster Project. Me and Eddie used to buy two and three keys of cocaine just for our personal. The entertainers wanted to take pictures with, with the likes of those men like Eddie Jackson. You name them, we served them. Richard Pryor, the Dale, the OJ. It's just a couple of old white guys sitting around a desk with a whole bunch of people bringing them money in. And what they were doing were, they were money launderers. You know, you ask yourself questions like tobacco. How many people died last year from tobacco? When we started talking about the moral value of what Eddie Jackson and others do. I'm not condoning what they do. What I'm simply saying is that there are many on that playing field. People from Israel, there's some people from South America, there's some people from West Africa, and then it's myself. Everybody in the city knew Eddie Jackson. And everybody knew he was on top of the pyramid. I was his right-hand man. 